Now on KGW News. Well, come on in. An Oregon lawmaker is caught on camera opening the state capitol doors to a crowd of armed demonstrators. Calling in the National Guard. The military will start helping with vaccine distribution in Oregon next week. Plus, friends say a man killed by Tigard police was in a mental health crisis. And she's not an animal. She's a man, she's a kind man who's just like in a crisis and needs help. And later, what's the chance President Trump would actually be impeached before his term is up? But first tonight, Oregon is calling in reinforcements to ramp up COVID vaccinations. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dan Haggerty, along with Laurel Porter. The National Guard will be stepping in to help with the goal of vaccinating 250 people per hour. By Tuesday, they'll be set up alongside Salem Health at the state fairgrounds. That clinic right now is only for people who live or work in Marion County. And no matter where you go, only people in the 1A group can get the shots right now. And that includes health care workers, first responders, and people living and working in nursing homes. The Guard will also deploy mobile teams to travel the state giving shots. In an update from the Oregon Health Authority today, we learn the state has received roughly 250,000 doses of the vaccine and used 73,000 doses. OHA has delivered vaccine doses to 190 sites across the state already. We'll allocate vaccine doses to an additional 30 sites next week, including hospitals, local public health agencies, federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics, urgent care clinics, retail pharmacies and emergency response agencies. After the 1A group is vaccinated, teachers will be up next. This next story tonight is infuriating. Vandals smashing out windows of a tiny home village that's being built to give shelter to people who are living on Portland streets. Organizers behind St. John's Village had planned to open this month, but as Catherine Cook reports, the vandalism was just one of the setbacks. In North Portland, 19 new tiny homes stand empty in St. John's, but not for long. In less than a month, people experiencing homelessness will move in, more than half of them from the St. John's area. But they'll be moving in a couple weeks later than planned. On December 18th, someone vandalized nearly every home in the St. John's Village, breaking windows and damaging door frames. Thousands of dollars in damage, right before volunteers plan to get them move in ready. The good thing is those volunteers were there and that frustration quickly turned into something positive though because they were there to help. Dennis Theralt is with Portland and Multnomah County's Joint Office of Homeless Services. They help fund the village, which is run by Do Good Multnomah. St. John's Christian Church leases the land to them. With so many people involved, it's no wonder few even heard about the damage. We got over it pretty quickly. I think that was the amazing thing. We had, you know, folks bringing donuts and, and, and their paintbrushes, and we just got the work done. But that was just the first setback. Mods PDX, the company that built the tiny homes, had their own unexpected delay, finishing a kitchen and bathroom for the village. Thrault says it should all be ready the first week of February. So not much of a delay, just a couple of weeks, but we want folks to have the best experiences possible when they get there. When they do, it'll cap off a two-year effort to create St. John's Village and serve as inspiration for others like it. No part of this city is spared, uh, you know, having folks suffer outside. And, uh, you know, we can make a difference for those folks in those pods, and that's really exciting and something we haven't been able to do enough of up here before. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Flags are flying at half staff in D.C. tonight to honor the police officer who died from injuries suffered during the violent siege of the U.S. Capitol. Meanwhile, police and federal agents are ramping up their investigation into who all was involved on Wednesday. One of the men seen as the face of the attack was arrested this afternoon. Here he is. His name is Richard Barnett. He was pictured with his feet on the desk of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Dozens have now been arrested, and at least 55 people are facing federal charges. Oregon Senator Ron Wyden was inside the Capitol when the mob moved in. He joined me for a taping of Straight Talk today. Wyden told me he places blame on President Trump and wants to see him removed from office. My view is the president is responsible for the carnage that we saw this week. Look, he spent weeks and weeks inciting this effort. This was not a one-time thing where he just tweeted once. He kept talking about a wild, wild set of events in Washington, uh, D.C. 
And the reality is we face an American carnage here and he did everything he possibly could over an extended period of time to promote it. If you miss Straight Talk tonight, it airs again Sunday morning at 10 a.m. right after Meet the Press, or you can watch our full interview right now online. President Trump tonight is accusing Twitter employees of coordinating with the radical left after the company permanently suspended his account today. He also said he's negotiating with other sites and even considering building out his own platform. Twitter said it suspended his account after a review found there was a risk of further incitement of violence. What we saw in D.C. is far from the only shameful behavior that we've seen in capitals across the country. In fact, both Oregon and Washington are upping security now in Salem and Olympia after incidents with armed protesters. You may remember last month when a group of armed protesters got inside the Oregon State Capitol during the special session. It turns out Representative Mike Nearman, a Republican from Independence, let them in. How do we know that he did that? Well, it's on camera. This is surveillance video of it happening. That's Nearman there going out the doors of the Capitol, making way for anti-lockdown rioters to storm in. About 30 seconds later, Oregon State troopers rushed over, as you see here, and pushed that group back outside. Oregon State Police is now investigating Representative Nearman, and he could face charges and punishment from the legislature. Lawmakers are back in session January 19th. That's just 11 days away. Friends of a man shot and killed by Tigard police this week want answers as to why he had to die. Police at the same time are pleading with people to be patient while an independent investigation plays out. And all the while, protests are boiling over in a community that thought this kind of outrage was reserved for bigger cities like Portland. Here's Maggie Vespa. He has been very sick for a long time and has uh, manic episodes. Friends of Jacob McDuff knew he was struggling and feared for his welfare, but this was beyond their worst nightmares. I've known him for two years and in his mind, I was the only person who loved him. Tiger police confirm an officer with the department shot and killed the 26 year old Wednesday. Police have been called to McDuff's apartment complex on a domestic disturbance. The Oregonian reporting dispatch audio indicates police were warned callers had concerns about McDuff's mental health. In a news release, police said McDuff had a knife and resisted arrest. During a struggle, an officer shot him. Police aren't releasing more details right now. Friday, a memorial sat in front of his complex near Southwest Hall Boulevard and Bonita Road. A search of McDuff's background shows no criminal record. Neighbors told us police had been called to his apartment five times in the two days leading up to the shooting, all for mental health concerns. Police wouldn't confirm that detail. Wednesday, officers were on scene around 4 p.m. Neighbors said police were there for several minutes before they heard shots. I stay put in my house. I don't want to get out. You, you heard know. the gunshots? Yes. How many? Maybe I just hear like three times. The Washington County Major Crimes Team, which is separate from Tiger PD, is investigating the shooting. They have not yet named the officer who killed McDuff. We're told that's all standard protocol. Still, police know anger at their profession is historically high. Thursday night, protests erupted in Tigard. People smashed windows at police headquarters and businesses downtown. Friday, police said 10 to 20 businesses sustained damage. At a news conference, while crews boarded up windows behind her, the chief denounced the vandalism and urged people to let the investigation play out. I'm not trying to skirt that. I understand people want answers. Um, However, and this is and, and it's frustrating for me as a leader of an organization to not be able to give those answers in a timely, but there is a process. There is a transparency. When I say transparency, it's not rushed to, to give information I don't even have. Police expect more protests Friday night. Tigered residents who came to see McDuff's memorial are blown away by this. Because we've been hearing about the stuff down in Portland, um, but to see it this close, it really like it brings a new level of like how real this is. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. We're hearing the plan from another local school district as many work to bring students back into the classrooms. The superintendent of Vancouver Public Schools is proposing a transition to hybrid learning. Students would be split into two groups. Two days a week, they'd attend school in person. The other three days would be spent in remote learning. The goal is to have kindergartners begin hybrid learning January 19th. 
first and second graders would begin on the 25th and third through fifth graders on February 1st. As long as transmission rates in Clark County stay within state guidelines, hybrid learning would extend to middle schoolers in February and high schoolers in March. It is important to note if hybrid learning is approved, parents would still have the option to keep their children in remote learning full time. The school board is set to discuss the recommendation on Tuesday.